Dissertation on the Form and Principles of the Sensible and the Intelligible World by Immanuel Kant. 1770. Notes. On the Form and Principles of the Sensible and Intelligible World, Immanuel Kant. 1770. Theorizes that the human mind is restricted to the logical world and thus can only interpret and understand occurrences according to their physical appearances. He wrote that humans could infer only as much as their senses allowed, but not experience the actual object itself. Thus, the term phenomenon refers to any incident deserving of inquiry and investigation, especially events that are particularly unusual or of distinctive importance. Dissertation on the Form and Principles of the Sensible and the Intelligible World. Section 1. On the idea of a world in general. Paragraph 1. As the analysis of a substantial composite terminates only in a part which is not a whole, that is, in a simple part, so synthesis terminates only in a whole which is not a part, that is, the world. In this exposition of the underlying concept I have had regard not only to the marks pertaining to the distinct cognition of the object but somewhat also to the two-fold genesis of the concept from the nature of the mind, which, being serviceable to a method of deeper metaphysical insight, by way of example appears to me not a little commendable. For it is one thing, the parts being given, to conceive the composition of the whole by an abstract notion of the intellect and another thing to follow out this general notion considered as a problem of the reason by the cognitive sensuous faculty. That is, to represent it to one's self in the concrete by a distinct intuition. The former is done through the class concept by composition, as several things are contained either under it or mutually, and hence by intellectual and universal ideas. The latter rests on the conditions of time. Inasmuch as the concept of a composite is possible genetically, that is by synthesis, by the successive union of part to part, and falls under the laws of intuition. Similarly, a substantial composite being given, we easily attain to the idea of the simple parts by the general removal of the intellectual notion of composition. For what remains after the removal of conjunction are the simple parts. But according to the laws of intuitive cognition this is not done, that is, all composition is not removed, except by a regress from the given whole to any possible parts whatsoever. In other words, by an analysis again resting on the condition of time. Opening square bracket. 1. But since in order to a composite a multiplicity, in order to a whole, the allness of parts is required, neither the analysis nor the synthesis will be complete. Hence neither by the former will the concept of the simple part emerge, nor by the latter the concept of the whole, unless either can be gone through within a time that is finite and assignable. But since in a continuous quantity the regress from the whole to assignable parts, and in an infinite quantity the progress from the parts to the given whole are endless, complete analysis in the one and complete synthesis in the other direction are impossible. Hence neither the whole in the first case as to composition, nor the composite in the latter case as to totality can be thought completely in accordance with the laws of intuition. Unthinkable and impossible being vulgarly deemed to have the same meaning. It is plain why the concepts of the continuous as well as that of the infinite are rejected by most men as concepts whose representation according to the laws of intuitive cognition is impossible. Although I do not here champion these notions, especially not the first, which are considered exploded by many schools, still the following reminder is of the greatest moment. Those who use so perverse an argumentation have fallen into a grave error. Opening square bracket. 2. For whatever is repugnant to the laws of the intellect and reason is of course impossible. But that which being the object of pure reason does merely not fall under the laws of intuitive cognition is not so. For here the disagreement between the sensuous and the intellectual faculties. Whose natures I shall presently explain.
indicates nothing except that the abstract ideas which the mind has received from the intellect can often not be followed out in the concrete and converted into intuitions. This subjective difficulty generally feigns some objective repugnance and easily deceives the incautious. The limits by which the human mind is circumscribed being taken for those by which the essence of things themselves is contained. Furthermore, as the argument from intellectual reasonings easily shows that substantial composites being given, whether by the testimony of the senses or otherwise, the simple parts and the world are also given. So does our definition point out causes contained in the nature of the subject why the notion of a world should not seem merely arbitrary and made up. As in mathematics, only for the sake of the deducible consequences. The mind intent upon resolving as well as compounding the concept of a composite demands and presumes boundaries in which it may acquiesce in the former as well as in the latter direction. Paragraph 2. In defining the world the following points require attention. I. Matter. In the transcendental sense. That is, the parts which are here assumed to be substances. We might plainly be regardless of coincidence between our definition and the meaning of the common word. The question being, so to speak, of a problem arising in accordance with the laws of reasoning, namely, how several substances may coalesce into one, and on what condition rests this one's being no part of another. But the force of the word world, as commonly used, of itself falls in with us. For no one will attribute accidents to the world as parts, but as determinations, states. Hence the so-called world of the ego, unrestrained by the single substance and its accidents, is not very appositely called a world, unless, perhaps, an imaginary one. For the same reason it is not permissible to refer the successive series namely, of states, as a part to the mundane whole. For modifications are not parts, but consequences of the subject. Finally, as to the nature of the substances constituting the world, I have not here called into debate whether they be contingent or necessary. Nor do I hide such a determination unproved in the definition in order subsequently, as is sometimes done, to draw it thence by some specious argumentation. But I shall show further on that their contingency can be amply concluded from the conditions here posited. e. Form, which consists in the coordination of the substances, not in their subordination. For coordinates are to be regarded as mutual complements to a whole, subordinates as effect and cause, or generally, as principle and consequence. The former relation is reciprocal and homonymous, any correlate in respect to any other being considered as at once determining and determined. The latter is heteronymous. On the one hand dependence only, causality on the other. This coordination is conceived as real and objective, not as ideal, and resting in the mere pleasure of a subject making up a whole by the summation of any multiplicity whatever. For the grasping of several things can by no contrivance be made a whole of representation, nor, for that reason, a representation of the whole. Therefore, if there be any totals of substances connected by no bond, a grasping of them together, the mind forcing the multiplicity into ideal oneness, will be called nothing more than a plurality of worlds comprehended in a single thought. But the connection constituting the essential form of a world is looked upon as the principle of the possible influences of the substances composing that world. For an actual influence pertains not to essence but to state, and the transitive forces the causes of the influences. Suppose some principle by which it is possible that the states of several things in other respects existing independently of each other are mutually related as consequences. Which principle being abandoned, the possibility of transitive force in a world is an illicit assumption. And, furthermore, this form essential to the world is on that account immutable, and exposed to no vicissitude whatever. 
It is so in the first place for a logical reason, since any change supposes the identity of the subject with determinations succeeding one another in turn. Hence the world, remaining the same world through all the states succeeding one another, preserves the same fundamental form. For it does not suffice to the identity of the whole that all the parts be identical, the identity of characteristic composition is required also. But it follows especially from a real cause. For the nature of the world, which is the primary inner principle of whatever variable determinations may pertain to its state, never by any possibility being opposite to itself, is naturally, that is, by itself, immutable. Hence there is given in any world whatever some form ascribable to its nature. Constant and invariable, as the perennial principle of any contingent and transitory form pertaining to the state of the world. They who hold this disquisition superfluous are confuted by the concepts of space and time. Conditions, as it were, given by their very own selves and primitive by whose aid, that is to say, without any other principle, it is not only possible but necessary for several actual things to be regarded as reciprocally parts constituting a whole. But I shall show presently that these are plainly not rational notions, nor the bonds which they form objective ideas, but phenomena and that though they witnessed, to be sure, some principle which is the common universal bond, it is not set forth by them e. Universality, which is the absolute allness of the appertaining parts. 4. Regard being had to any given composite. Though it may be besides a part of another, still there always obtains a certain comparative allness, namely, that of the parts belonging to it as a particular quantity. But in this case whatsoever things are regarded as mutually parts of whatsoever whole, are understood to be conjointly posited. This absolute totality, apparently an everyday and perfectly obvious concept, especially when, as happens in the definition, it is enunciated negatively, when canvassed thoroughly becomes the crucial test of the philosopher. For it is scarce conceivable how the inexhaustible series of the states of the universe succeeding one another eternally be reducible to a whole comprehending all changes whatsoever since it is necessary to very infinitude to be without end. And hence no successive series is given but what is the part of another, completeness or absolute totality is by parity of reasoning plainly excluded. For although the notion of a part can be taken in a universal sense, and although everything contained under this notion, if regarded as posited in the same series, constitutes unity, yet the concept of the whole appears to exact their all being taken simultaneously, which in the case given is impossible. For, although to the whole series nothing succeeds, there is given in the succession no posited series to which nothing succeeds, unless it be the last. There will, then, in eternity be something which is last, which is absurd. Perhaps some may think that the difficulty which besets a successive infinite is absent from a simultaneous infinite. For the reason that apparently simultaneity plainly professes to embrace all at the same time. But, if the simultaneous infinite be admitted, the successive infinite also will have to be conceded, and the negation of the latter cancels the former. For the simultaneous infinite offers matters everlastingly inexhaustible to a successive progress in infinitum through its innumerable parts. Which numberless series actually being given in the simultaneous infinite, a series though inexhaustible by successive addition could be given as a whole. In solution of the perplexing problem note. That both the successive and the simultaneous coordination of several things since they rest upon the concept of time, do not pertain to the intellectual concept of a whole, but only to the conditions of sensuous intuition. Hence though not sensuously conceivable, they do not on that score cease being intellectual concepts. For in order to the latter it suffices that coordinates be given, no matter how, and that they be thought of as all pertaining to a unit. Section 2 
on the distinction between the sensible and the intelligible generally. Paragraph 3. Sensibility is the receptivity of a subject by which it is possible for its representative state to be affected in a certain way by the presence of some object. Intelligence, rationality, is the faculty of a subject by which it is able to represent to itself what by its quality cannot enter the senses. The object of sensibility is sensuous. What contains nothing but what is knowable by the intellect is intelligible. In the older schools the former was called phenomenon, the latter noumenon. To the extent to which knowledge is subject to the laws of sensuousness it is sensuous. To the extent to which it is subject to the laws of intelligence it is intellectual or rational. Paragraph 4. Since whatever is in sensuous knowledge depends upon the subject's peculiar nature. As the latter is capable of receiving some modification or other from the presence of objects which on account of subjective variety may be different in different subjects. Whilst whatever knowledge is exempt from such subjective condition regards the object only. It is plain that what is sensuously thought is the representation of things as they appear, while the intellectual presentations are the representations of things as they are. Now there is in sense representation something which may be called the matter. Namely, the sensation, and in addition to this something which may be called the form. Namely, the appearance of the sensible things, showing forth to what extent a natural law of the mind coordinates the variety of sensuous affections. Furthermore, as the sensation constituting the matter of sensuous representations argues, to be sure, the presence of something sensible, but depends as to quality on the nature of the subject, as the latter is modifiable by the object. Exactly so does the form of that representation witness certainly some reference or relation among the sensuous percepts. But itself is not, as it were, the shadowing force or outlining of the object, but only a certain law inherent in the mind for coordinating among themselves sensuous percepts arising from the presence of the object. For by form or appearance the objects do not strike the sense. Hence in order that various sense-affecting objects may coalesce into some whole of representation, there is need of an inner principle of the mind by which, in accordance with stable and innate laws, that variety shall take on some appearance. Paragraph 5. To sensual cognition then pertains both the matter which is sensation and by which the knowledge is said to be sensual, and the form by which, even though we find it without any sensation, the representations are called sensuous. On the other hand, as to intellectual concepts, it is above all to be well noted that the use of the intellect, or of the superior faculty of the soul, is twofold. By the first use are given the very concepts both of things and relations. This is the real use. By the second use they, whensoever given, are merely by common marks subordinated to one another, the lower to the higher, and compared among themselves according to the principle of contradiction. This is called the logical use. The logical use of the intellect is common to all the sciences. The real use is not. For a cognition given in any wise is regarded either as contained under or as opposed to a mark common to several cognitions. And this either by immediate apposition, as in judgments in order to distinct cognition, or mediately, as in reasoning, in order to adequate cognition. Thus sensuous knowledge being given. Sensuous percepts are by the logical use of the intellect subordinated to other sensuous percepts, as to common concepts, and phenomena to the more general laws of phenomena. In this connection it is of the greatest moment to note that cognitions must continue to be regarded as sensuous, no matter how great may have been the logical use of the intellect upon them. For they are called sensuous on account of their origin, not of their collation by identity and opposition. Hence, empirical laws, though of the greatest generality, are, nevertheless, sensual, 
and the principles of sensuous form in geometry, the relations in determinate space. However much the intellect arguing according to logical rules from what is sensuously given by pure intuition be employed upon them do not for that matter pass beyond the class of sense percepts. That in sense percepts and phenomena which precedes the logical use of the intellect is called appearance. While the reflex knowledge originating from several appearances compared by the intellect is called experience. Thus there is no way from appearance to experience except by reflection according to the logical use of the intellect.